Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech-related questions. You can submit your questions down in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time. Without further ado... Okay, first Hello, question. Alex. When I was coasting downhill on my gravel bike in the hardest gear, the chain spontaneously jumped off of the cassette. Could my chain be too long? Could this be prevented if I remove one link, or would it cause other issues? Well... Potentially a chain could be too long, but if you were to remove a link or two out of your chain, you need to make sure that when you're in the um, largest chain ring, if you've got two by or single ring at the front, and the largest sprockets at the back, and the chain isn't too short, then it stretches the derailleur and puts undue stress on it. A um, little bit of trial and error needs to be done here, but shift into that gear and check that the derailleur has a little bit of free play in it. And if it looks like it's pretty loose, or when you're in that hardest gear, the chain is saggy, then there's the answer, your chain is a bit too long. Yeah. Hmm. Also, well, yeah, if, it, if you didn't hit a bump, yeah, that was the other thing. Sometimes it can just happen if you do... You yeah, you might have just been really unlucky. Yeah. That was a good point, yeah. Um, right, next. Uh, it's from at Mr. Basti Bast. Okay, yeah. Who says, hi Manon and Alex. <laughs> Alright, Manon. I'm planning on <laughs> assembling a new bike with an aluminium frame and I'm not sure what type of grease or assembly paste to use to install my T47 bottom bracket. And also around the headset area where I have a carbon fork. I have muck off bio grease on hand that I already use on all my screws, pedals and through axles. Is it convenient for the bottom bracket shell and headset as well? Yeah. Thank you very much for the feedback. Cheers, Bastian. Yeah, use whatever typical standard normal grease you have. You don't need to go out and buy anything Fancy, sounds like what you've got is going to be fine for the job. There's no need for any like over the top new parts to buy. Easy. There you go. Um, a Jackson 999 says, Dear gurus, who are I those guys? <laughs> I've got a chain maintenance question. Living in Australia, I pretty much only ride outdoors in dry conditions and aim to do around 200 kilometers per week. After every 30 to 50 kilometer ride, I wipe down my chain with a cloth and then lubricate it with muck off dry loop. I still tend to notice greasy deposits after wiping the chain down between the inner and outer plates. If I'm using a wax-based dry lube, should I still be completely degreasing my dry train, including the cassette jockey wheels, every week, or will wiping it down and reapplying like dry lube just be enough? There's a lot going on there. There is a lot going on. <laughs> but, um, well, Alex did a, an, an excellent video, well, we did it together actually, where we hmm. were discussing a deep dive into lube with Josh Portner, um, who is the lube king. And I would suggest ha having a watch of that, as it does answer a lot of what you're saying, yeah. um, and more. But the basic thing is, is that those a lot of those sort of dry lubes you know, are not really recommended. Yeah. Like, science is constantly evolving and our understanding of lubrication technology is improving all the time. And, you know, lubes that might have been decent lubes, you know, years ago, uh, you know, aren't as, as keeping up with, like, the modern the modern understanding of, of what's good for your drivetrain. And so, yeah, that sort of dry, oily lube... Not necessarily the best option out there. But the process... One of the worst options out there. But the process of what they're doing in terms of the time frames between applying whatever lube you're choosing to use and like maintaining it, wiping it and degreasing it, I'd say is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a good process to have and maybe just look at alternative or all the different chain lube options. Yeah, out there. I mean, you don't have to go the full hog and do waxing, but I think a good option for you, especially in the dry conditions you're in, would be an emulsified like drip-on ceramic lube. Um, you know, we use the Silka Super Secret. There are a couple of other products out there from other brands um, that that are a similar kind of deal, and that's not the same as a, the dry lube that you're using. It's going to stay on much better. And in terms of your maintenance question, yeah, what you would typically do is have a have a clean chain that's been stripped. You would then apply that, and then so it's not got the other lubes in it, and then you just basically periodically, when it starts to get noisy, top it up, well, wipe it down with a microfiber and then top it up with that drip-on emulsified um, wax. Fantastic explanation, that, I love it. Um, Nicholas next says, if I want to change my drivetrain from Shimano to SRAM, I have to change the freer body and the bottom brackets. Are there any third-party parts who fit both systems? Um, well, there probably are some mm. parts out there, but I would suggest... Um, 
well, it doesn't matter, but personally, I like to try and keep like the whole group sets complete, like, yeah. rather than mixing yeah. different brands. The only difference where your bottom bracket could stay the same would be, I think, with regards to cassettes, I would I would stick with the brand uh, for, yeah. the, for optimal shifting. But with regards to chain sets, you, you can often run different brand chain sets. Um, and so, you know, for example, on on my Orbea that I've got outside yeah. here right now, I, I have a Quark power meter on there. So it's a SRAM bottom bracket for the Quark power meter. Um, but then I've got Shimano chain rings on that. Yeah. Or you could run, say, a rotor power meter, which has rotor chain rings that can be compatible with both SRAM and Shimano. And that way, you you know, you might not be able, you might not need to change, you know, your bottom bracket, things like that. So yeah, lots of options. Yeah. Bit of research, find what sort of fits your needs and budget the best. Yeah. Uh, next question. <laughs> Some random four three nine three. They say, hi GCN Tech, I read that it's strongly recommended to use a trainer tyre for an indoor wheel on trainer. Yes, yes it is. Are trainer tyres also recommended for use with rollers, brackets, aluminium drums? Do rollers cause excessive wear on normal road tyres? I don't want to cause unexpected wear on my tyres, thanks in advance. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it depends. I mean, if you're going to be using rollers as a dedicated indoor training setup, which some people do, mm -hmm. then yeah, it might be worth having some other tyres on there. Rollers aren't necessarily as, as noisy, so if it's not for noise, then I wouldn't worry too much. If you're going to be warming up, at, uh, if you're using rollers to warm up at mm, a race, like which is what a lot of yeah, people okay. do, the, the faff of taking some different wheels out and putting some different wheels in with different yeah. tyres, like, you don't want that. So I would, and you're only on there for like 20 minutes before a race. I would just suck it up and use my race tires if I was warming up. But if, yeah, I said if you're using it for dedicated indoor training, I'd probably just use some older tires. Like yeah. if you've got, you know, if you've got an older set that are a bit cut up, just use those because they're not going to get little flints in them while you're on the rollers. And you know, if you've just got a set that are a bit worn, use those. Yeah, I think that I I sort of echo your advice. If you've got a bike set up, like dedicated, or a wheel to use just indoors, I think one of those sort of indoor trainer type tires would be good, rather than regularly using your good tires indoors. Save those for when you want them best. Okay, yeah. right, onto our last question. It's from Shell Well, or Shell E Well. Interesting thought, RE nitrogen in tires. A lot of, this generated a lot of <laughs> yeah. chat, this yeah. nitrogen comment. For someone asking, should you put nitrogen in tires? L um, it's, last week. it's a few weeks back because you yeah. weren't here to get all nerdy and sciencey with you us. Did it, I, I, watched I it. tried. It good, yeah. I tried. I spent too much time with you. Um, <laughs> what might actually make sense in some tubeless setups? Oh, so what's a different gas? Some tan sidewall tubeless tyres seem to have a reputation for leaking air slowly out of the sidewall at first because they can be a little bit more porous. Maybe nitrogen would get them through that teething problem. I presume you're now going to talk to us about molecule sizes and stuff like that? I think... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, this was actually quite intriguing. I mean, right, first up, no one is going to inflate their tyres with nitrogen. That is a completely <laughs> pointless thing to do. Yeah. But I think that the oxygen in the air is actually required to make the sealant work. It might do, yeah. It might not dry out correctly. Yeah. Maybe we're going to have to do a deep dive into this subject. My initial thoughts but on it's, there. But it's the, but it's the, but it's like the sealant, the porosity of the sealant against the side wall is what cures those tires. But not all tires do that. A lot of tubeless tires don't have that porosity issue. They yeah. hold air pretty well. I feel like, like this was more of a problem. Go back like when tubeless was first becoming a thing. Yeah. But now I think tire tech has evolved that. I haven't seen this problem for quite a long time. Now. Yeah, I'm actually surprised. I'm finding that my tubeless tyre setups are holding air better than latex tube clincher setups. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, that wasn't the case, though, like you said. Yeah. Few year, go back five years, yeah. and I think that they were leaking a bit more. But now there's these ERTO standards. E-T-R-T-O. -E whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> um, on tubeless tyres, they, they seem to be a lot better. Well, that's the whole point of it. It's designed to make the standards and tolerances tighter and tighter and tighter to make everything safer and safer and safer. Mm. There you go. Right, that's it for this week's GCN TechNet. As always, hope we've answered your question. If we haven't, don't be angry at us. Just keep commenting it in the comment section down below, and we'll get to it in the coming weeks. Love you. Bye. Bye.